Hi, Reese. How are you today? Great, Nick. This week is our second time we're going to talk about the bees and neonicotinoids, which have been in the yeah, Brussels. Yeah, they're in the news, mate. You yeah, know, it's a big day yesterday in Brussels. We're very excited. <laughs> Can you, in a nutshell, just give us a quick recount of what are neonicotinoids? Okay, this is a, a new chemical a pesticide class that it's uh, systemic, so it's in the seed. It mimics the effects of nicotine, which for uh, insects is can be detrimental. And they, they're in these seeds to ward off all of the, the bad pests. And the unforeseen, very important unforeseen complication is that they have been killing billions and billions of wild and honeybees around the globe. This is a nasty poison and it, it hangs around in the soil for about a decade, killing all the soil organisms and it reverberates up the system because without soil insects, the little meadow birds uh, are dying and the hawks at the top of the food chain that rely on the meadow birds for a, a snicker snack they too are, are uh, failing. So this has got a bad reverberation. It also hangs around in the water, Nick. So this is, it's a chemical that we need to do away with big time. With all of it being in the news, why should the public be concerned? Well, very much. We, we all need to be aware. Uh, we are what we eat. And the, these chemicals are they're they're just not right. So the the, the good thing is uh, this is one of the few occasions where Mother Nature, which has been copping it on the chin and on the backside for so long and so hard, is, is getting a a slight reprieve. The the ban is is temporary. Uh, it will be revisited, but in the meantime. Uh, the wild honeybees and the, um, the the wild bees and the domesticated honeybees are going to get a a chance not to be poisoned to death. And and, and the other thing is, uh, as uh, apex or top uh, predators on the food chain, a little bit of poison uh, that we eat is what what they call biomagnified up the system. So a little bit of poison, and then a human eats it becomes um, in some cases, 10 to 100 times stronger. So we don't want to be eating, no one wants to be knowingly eating a little bit of poison. No. When you're here in the spring, one of the nicest places you can go to are fantastic garden centres that we've got all over the UK. How are they contributing uh, positive or negatively to, to our bees? First of all, kudos to Friends of the Earth because they've taken this campaign to heart, and not just in the UK, but worldwide. They've stepped up and they're bringing this to the attention of home base B and Q Wicks, Notcuts, Hillier, Squires, Blue Diamond, Scats, and others. All of the garden stores across the UK said, right, we're not going to have any of these neonicotinoids in any products on our shelves. And early in January, it started in January, they began removing them from the shelves. And there's a very good reason why, because inadvertently, the concentration of these neonicotinoids in America were upwards of 120 times stronger in the little garden products than they were being applied in agriculture. So the UK garden stores said, not on our watch, it's going to happen. So it's just leadership. So now that leads us nicely on to how important are wild bees? Wild bees are, are unbelievably important, Nick. We, we never realized, for, first of all, we have a very poor understanding of their populations. We do know that in the UK and in America and elsewhere, there are a number of bumblebees that are missing. Uh, some have gone extinct or some are very, very close. But most of the bees around the globe, and there are 20,000 different species that we know of. There may be as many as 40,000, but there's 20,000 documented. And 95 or 6 or 7 percent are what we call solitary bees. They go about their business very quietly, all by their lonesome. And it turns out that the solitary and the bumblebees in the UK and elsewhere contribute immensely to the pollination on the farmer's field. And when I say immensely, they're much, much more effective 
at pollinating than the domesticated honeybees. And we have very poor survey numbers of them. We need all our bees, Nick. And, you know, the, the listeners in, in the UK need to understand that we're missing 50% of our domesticated honeybees over the last 25 years. And we don't even have good numbers on the wild bees. So the fact Huge. that they're dying, oh, yeah, we, we've got to protect everything. So what can we do this spring to, to help out? I've got a strong feeling that we're we're coming to a time where we we're going to all be asked to to plant gardens, uh, much like the the Victory Gardens for WW two, and I, I say that because if the listeners remember last summer, it was such a a bust with all of the rain that most of all the produce, which would have in the summer been grown uh, locally in the UK, had to be imported. So each of us need to grow some t- tomatoes. We need to grow some peppers. If you've got a, a yard, you, you need to have a fruit tree. You need to have an apple or a plum tree because you've got to, we got to, it's coming down to how we feed ourselves and how we afford to feed ourselves because the listeners will remember the cost of everything went up last summer. And by the way, it hasn't come down. I was so shockingly upset to hear that the uh, the chief scientist was almost an advocate for these poisons because on the market right now, there's a, a wonderful Indian uh, from the subcontinent India, uh, Indian tree, neem, N-E-E-M. And neem is one of the most powerful trees in its insect repelling properties. There's several names in the garden stores that the listeners can look for. Turplex, Azotanese, Align, Bioneem, Marjosan, O. These are all products that have this neem tree based insecticide slash pesticide in there that are so natural. They don't harm any animals. They don't harm any bees, any birds, any moths, any butterflies. So I I really think we've got to do that. I I think that unless it turns out to be another torrential, completely rainy summer in the UK, fingers crossed that it doesn't, I would also remind the um, listeners that to add a, a to take out a little a saucepan of water each morning, leave it in your yard so that the bees can have something to drink because during the summer they too are thirsty. Okay, what does the EU ruling mean regarding the use of neonicotinoids, and who are the winners and losers in this? What it means, thankfully, is three of these very toxic poisons will not be allowed to be put on seeds and toxify the soil and the water and kill the bees. The winners are our wonderful bees globally uh, and in obviously the UK and, and all of the EU, wild and domesticated. The people are winners because I, I don't subscribe to eating a little bit of poison. You know, a little bit of poison every meal or every bite of food sure. is, is not cool. And the, the losers are Syngenta and Bear Crop Science because, quite frankly, they're going to be losing tens and likely hundreds of billions of dollars killing nature. Uh-huh. And, I, you know, I'm a simple scientist. I, I got to say, I don't really understand a lot of things, but I do understand what I read. In 1982, at the United Nations in New York, every country, it's about 192 or 94 in that year, signed the World Charter for Nature. The first two articles are very clear. Number one, nature shall be respected and its essential processes shall not be impaired. Number two, the genetic variability on the earth shall not be compromised. The population levels of all life forms, wild and domesticated, must be at least sufficient for their survival. And to this end, necessary habitats shall be safeguarded. I would suggest that the countries that signed this, that would be every country, 
I might want to revisit what the I was going to say. Yeah, I think there's a lot of corporations who could do with reading that. It's very, very important because we do have to protect nature. You know, if, look, if we make a mistake, we make a mistake. This takes us on a slightly to, to the whole neonicotinoids and the precautionary principle. There's a new British chief scientific advisor, Sir Mark Walport, who's looking very much like a controversial figure from day one. And he stated that banning neonicotinoids could harm the EU's and the UK's future food production. That makes me very upset because I hear a very similar argument uh, from the country of Japan that they need to manage killing all of the whales so they can have something to eat. Uh, those so, two, uh, they're the most ludicrous, uh, non-scientific, non-protecting uh, nature trains of thoughts I have ever, ever encountered. I imagine that the chief scientist in any nation, his or her primary job is not to fear monger. Fear mongering was something that the kings of 10,000 years ago did to keep everybody in a state of paralysis. So I'm shocked that an argument like that would be put forward. I think that this is a grand opportunity for our society at large to understand that life goes beyond the smartphone, the tablet, and your GPS in your brand new vehicle if you've got one. There are seven plus billion people. In eight and a half years, there's going to be eight billion people. We've got to get our act together because we're missing plants. The oceans are being brutalized within to a degree of their existence. Three out of every four breaths of air come from the ocean, irrespective of where you live on the globe. And our biggest concern right about now, in addition to having enough food to eat, is where we're going to get enough air for the next billion people to breathe. So the chief scientists be, should be concerned on matters like that. We'll be all right with our food for the meantime, but I do believe that each of us need to be aware and each of us need to be growing some pots of uh, tomatoes and peppers in our, uh, on our balcony if you've got a flat or in your backyard if you're fortunate and have a little home. And we need to be very aware of what's going on. And when we do get our honey, go to the, uh, the farmer's markets and support your local beekeeper. They need our help. Don't just be buying stuff off the shelf that could come from anywhere in the EU or around the world. we got to think locally, Nick. Sure. So you, you, the, the level of consciousness is, is, is coming up, and that's really what we need. I um, urge the listeners to look at what Prince Charles has been doing over the years. He's got all this stuff on future-proofing. He gets it, and it's about time the chief scientists begin to uh, stand up for nature. And starts acting like a scientist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Reese. Cheers, matey. Take care. Speak soon. Bye-bye.